Okay, if you want to grab your seats, uh, we're going to get started here this morning. <laughs> this is the, the dilemma when you give people a little break, a little intermission to go say hi to their friends and grab some coffee or something to drink. It's always hard getting them back. So, hey guys, come on back. We're going to get started. Good morning, everyone who is here and upstairs in our overflow and also online. It's great to have you this morning. Uh, one brief announcement that I forgot to make as we were getting started this morning is that um, uh, this Sunday is the last Sunday that I will be here with you for a few weeks. Uh, keep the applause down, please. Uh, so you're going to get a break from me uh, for actually for five Sundays. Uh, we'll be around but away. And we're going to have some guest speakers really uh, encouraged this year that we're going to be having uh, four different uh, gentlemen come over five weeks to speak here at the Rock Church. Uh, two of them are from Westside Church in Vancouver. Next Sunday, Aaron Boswell, he's, he's director of internships uh, with Westside Church. He will be, be speaking here on July 22nd and August 12th. And then Joseph Peterson, who is the youth pastor at Westside Church in Vancouver, will also be here. And then in August, uh, a fellow who planted a church, believe it or not, with a group of other people in Greece, him and his wife, they were there nine years, they're now back here in Canada hoping to plant a church somewhere in Vancouver. And his name is Heath Makel, and he will be here on August 19th. So, as I said, you get a break from me, we get a break, it's going to be awesome. Some guest speakers, <laughs> I, knew, I knew someone would say yay. You know, I, it, feelings are mutual, no kidding. I will miss you while we're away. So listen, if you have your Bibles with you, open them to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Last week we started a very brief two-week series uh, uh, after breaking from the Gospel of Luke that we've been in uh, all year to this point so far. Uh, I simply wanted to do a, a brief two-week message on, on summer and the gift of summer, and uh, we've been highlighting Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, last week we looked at the whole idea of seasons, you know, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and because there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to reap. But then the question last week is, what goes on in between? when you plant and you reap. And of course, we discovered that it's vacation, right? It's time to pull out a church, pull out of everything else, every other commitment, and just take a break. No, actually, it's a time for growth, not only organically in the soil and in our world, but also personally in our spiritual walk and in our growth with those people whom we've been planting seeds with throughout the year. Amen? Amen. I know most of you got that message really well last week, so... And if you didn't, it's online. You can you view it for yourself. But, so read with me. I want to read uh, the first eight, eight verses this morning just to get us started back into that, that song that was written by the birds right in 1965, Turn, Turn, Turn. Uh, they actually took, it's actually, I heard this week, it is the oldest um, lyrics of a song ever written in the United States. Do you realize that? Because these lyrics were written 3,000 years ago. Right? So that's pretty amazing. Let me read the passage, and then I'm going to pray one more time, and then we're going to dive in for today. Solomon writing in chapter 3, verse 1, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. Pray with me, would you? Yeah, Father, we, we thank you uh, that the, the wisdom and the waywardness of Solomon's life has been recorded for us. We thank you, Lord, that there are great lessons in this man's life and in the words that he recorded as his observations from his life. But Lord, we know that these words, these observations, and all of these times, we know they come from you. So, Heavenly Father, again, we pray today, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak through me, through my uh, feeble and weak understanding and words, honestly. I, I just pray that um, this is great wisdom, 
And I pray that we would leave here today uh, not only understanding you better and knowing more about you and who you are and what you've done and, and the wisdom of Solomon, but also, Lord, who we are and how then we should live. And so, Lord, I pray these things. I pray you would encourage us and bless us, and I pray this in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. So I'll highlight on screen for you one more time the two verses uh, that start this passage off. And as I said already, we've taken our outline for this series actually from these two verses. Last week, we started with the back half of the second verse, right? A time to plant and a time to pluck. And here we saw uh, Solomon pointing to the times and seasons in each year, winter, spring, summer, and fall within that part. This week, uh, we're going to be looking at the, the first part of that verse, really about, the, about our lives, about the season between when we are born and when we die. And really, the most important thing that we picked up last week, which is really, really critical for us to remember today, because some of this is hard, some of this is difficult, it's challenging, it's tough. We need to realize and recognize that when it comes to being born and when you will die, you have no say in that matter. <laughs> we have no say in any of these times, quite frankly, that we see Solomon talking about here, God does. God is in control of every circumstance, every time in our lives. That's challenging for some of us who are philosophers and, and believe in free will or try to anyway and understand the concept of that and God's sovereignty in our lives and in our world. So today we're going to focus on the first half, a time to be born and a time to die. And our question for today then is, what happens in between? Because those are those bookends, right? The bookend of planting and harvesting is summer in the middle, and that is for growth. Well, what goes on between when we're born and we die? And obviously, the Sunday school answer is life, pastor. Okay, we're done. We can go. No, there's a lot more going on there we need to look at. Now, many people, I remember when we did this series about five, six years ago, we went through the whole book of Ecclesiastes. And I remember reading in a lot of commentaries and a lot of articles and other pastors' words that uh, a lot of people uh, kind of feel that, uh, go figure, that Solomon's writings, particularly Ecclesiastes, is very cynical, right? It's very pessimistic. It is really a very negative view of life. And it's actually very true. Uh, we, we could easily get the impression that the author, King Solomon, is really the definition of a pessimist, of a cynic. And that's how actually some people get to write off what he says, discount what he says. Oh, he's just a... He's just a cynic, you know. He's just a glasses-half-full guy, right? I don't like to look at life that way. And people write off what he has to say, which is pretty, pretty sad when you think about it. So we, we need to remember again, uh, as I mentioned last week after all, here's a guy who starts off really well. He starts off quite humbly uh, as the, the next king after his father, King David, and, and he's really humble about it. He feels he's in his early 20s. He feels like, I'm not worthy of this job. I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I don't people of Israel, I'm like, goodness, and I'm following my, my father, King David, how do I do this? How do I lead these people? I have no clue. I'm not equipped for this. Well, God actually hears his prayer and hears his lament, and God offers him a, a, a genie opportunity, right? God says to him, ask me anything you want. Just ask whatever you might want from me. And so Solomon asks God, he goes, well, I, I need wisdom, and I need knowledge so that I can lead your people. And God's pretty impressed with him, the scripture would indicate, and his humility. But God says this to him. He says these actual words. He says, because you didn't, listen, ask for wisdom, knowledge, and a long life. He did ask for wisdom, knowledge, but he didn't ask for a long life, which every Jewish ruler, leader, person, that would be considered prosperity in that day, right? Lots of possessions, wealth, and a long life. That's a blessing from God. Because you didn't ask for that, I will give you wisdom and knowledge, yes, but also wealth, possessions, and honor, such as no king who was before you ever had and none after you will have. Now, I made the statement, I think, last week that he was the richest man ever, richer than Bill Gates, richer than Warren Buffett, richer than any uh, uh, Saudi uh, prince or king. And some people today go, oh, come on, really? God says so in his word. And I take him at his word. He actually said that. So, well, as you know, Solomon, Solomon, we know the story, he lost his way. It seems that this kind of went to his head. 
And he got to the point where he, he thought he was so wise and so knowledgeable about what was going on, and things had been going well, he decided, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my life to conduct an experiment. And he spends 40 years giving himself to this experiment. And basically, the experiment was he wanted to know if it was possible for a human being to find success, happiness, and fulfillment in this life under the sun, which literally means apart from God, living a, a secular humanist life. And he gives himself to that for 40 years to this experiment, like really gave himself to it. And he had all the tools to give himself to it like you and I will never have. All the money, all the possessions, guys, all the women. He gave, he gave himself to all of that for 40 years. His conclusion? It's futile. I wasted my life. It's, it's vanity. Meaningless. And my favorite phrase that he uses, it's like chasing the wind. You're never happy. You're never really going to get there. So this book that he writes then outlines his findings in great, great details. That's what the book is really all about. It's, it's his report <laughs> about what he did with his life and what he observed, not only in his own life, but in the life of others during that 40 years. His kind of, you know, his wannabes who hung around with him and everyone else who was struggling through life. It's his report card. And so we should read this book and I think be very thankful because he's done all of us a great favor. 3,000 years ago, nothing new under the sun, he said in the first chapter. Here it is, the wisdom of the ages right here. You know what, I, I think you probably would agree with me. Even for people who've studied it, really studied it and read it over and over, we don't pay attention. Clearly, we're not evolving in this way, right? I mean, we might be evolving in other ways, but clearly, socially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, we're not evolving. Generation after generation, the same problem. He continually talks about the cycles of life, how things go around and come around, generation after generation, making the same mistake, and until this day is my point to us today. And as we learned in our, we did a, the Desire Wisdom series last year, which many people felt quite profitable, and we looked at some of his proverbs, Solomon's proverbs, and I, I, I put this phrase out, this saying out during that series, I think it applies to what we're learning from Solomon here today, and it is this, you can have all the knowledge in the world, and yet without will, wisdom, still make bad decision, after bad decision, after bad decision, even to the point going down certain roads where some of us will make a train wreck of our very lives. Because we can have all the worldly knowledge, we can get all the degrees we want, we can think we're really, really smart, and actually be really, really smart. Under the sun, no wisdom from above, you're going to make bad decisions. It's just the way it is. Now, I know that sounds a bit cynical, right? It does, doesn't it? It's pessimistic. It's, it's just not encouraging. Give me something for summer, Glenn. I want to leave here today really encouraged and lifted up. Well, I think that's what some people would say today when they read Solomon, when they read Ecclesiastes especially, is that it's really cynical. Um, I don't know how, if many of you have ever, ever heard any, or lately, any really good commencement speeches. Anybody heard any really good commencement, valedictorian, any graduates in your, in your life, you know, any of those type of things? I, I've heard a few in my life, and I actually, uh, I, like to, I like to listen to some online, and very popular people have done commencement speeches, and, and they're pretty amazing. Um, you know the most popular uh, version of them is uh, that people get up in front of this graduating class of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed graduates that are going to go conquer the world, right? It's always very motivational and inspirational, and there's typically a, a phrase in that speech where it's something like, you know, if you just work hard and you use all of the knowledge that you've now learned, you can change the world. You ever heard that? Yeah. I've heard it actually a few times. You can change the world. Uh, Steve Jobs actually is one of the people that in those speeches, everybody brings up for some reason. Why? Because here's an example of a guy who actually didn't go to university, which is kind of weird, saying that at a commencement thing when your parents have just spent tens of thousands of dollars to send you to this university. But here's a guy who did not go to university, or at least graduate, and he apparently did change the world. I'm actually okay with that. He did change the world in certain ways, but... So he's put up there as an example to people. But one of my favorites, honestly, is if you go online, you can Google this, you can find it on YouTube, is this um, 
this admiral, <laughs> he, he gave a, a talk to a, a graduating military class, and it was really, it was at the University of Texas at Utah, at Austin, pardon me, his name is Admiral William H. McRaven. It's an awesome speech, you should go watch it, but he actually said this, there's one line I want to take from his commencement to these young men and women that were listening to him, he said this, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed every morning. <laughs> okay, they even laughed at that time, okay? But, but, but and, and he, here's a military guy, and then he went on to explain his rationale because, well, in the military, that's what you have to do, right? Every morning when you get up, you've got to make your bed, and it's got to be crisp, right? And your boots better be shined, and you better be ready for the day, and it's going to be inspected. It's boot camp every day in the military. And so he makes a, a fantastic point. He wasn't kidding. He explains this to them, and it's awesome. But I actually heard a valedictorian speech, uh, a commencement um, speech this past year at Briarcrest in April of this year, when our son Jonathan graduated. Uh, he was not the valedictorian, uh, but a gal by the name of Sheridan Clifford was. And it was a fantastic speech. Uh, it's a Christian college, all the rest of it. But she actually started by saying something like this. Let's start by dispensing with the usual you can go change the world stuff. That's how she started. And from that point, she went on to call all of her fellow grads at Briarcrest to a life of dedication to Christ and to his church. That was a little different. That was an amazing commencement speech. Uh, there's a pastor, author, and leader, some of you heard me talk about whose blog and, and podcasts I follow. His name is Kerry Niewoof. Um, He's releasing a new book in September. I really wish this book was available today so I could recommend it to some of you for summer reading. Uh, it's going to be coming out soon. I'm actually on the uh, pre-launch team. I'm invited to be on the pre-launch team to read the book and uh, to do some reviews and post them online when the book, uh, just before the book comes out, obviously to get, gather some interest in the book. Uh, and so I've already read the introduction, the first chapter. They're only releasing a chapter at a time to us. It's going to be a fantastic book. Uh, the book is called Didn't See That Coming. Now, here's a pastor of several years, a leader. He was a lawyer at one time in life. And he's writing uh, this book because his experience is kind of, again, Solomon-like, not because he led a life like that, but he's seen it in people's life, that people go through life. They get their 20s, their 30s, and they end up in situations where they're like, didn't see that coming. And yet, generation after generation after generation could tell you <laughs> it's coming. It's a fantastic book. And, and he basically puts it this way. I think I could summarize what he's saying is, and, and this, and it's the same point to what we've been looking at. Why is it that so many of us start out early in life with such high hopes, so inspired to change the world, at least make a difference, and to find happiness and success in life? Why is it that so many of us become sadly cynical by the time we're even 35, 40, or younger in some cases. Do you know anybody like that? <laughs> you know anybody even, you know, 30, 35, who's kind of like negative about everything? <laughs> like kind of cynical and pessimistic about the weather? Yeah, I don't know if the weather's going to hold by the time we go on vacation, you know. <laughs> yeah. Probably going to rain all week. You know, somebody like that, right? Uh, negative, cynical about house prices in Squamish, gas prices, politics. I mean, just go figure, right? There's a whole pile of them, right? Relationships, the company they work for, kind of cynical, pessimistic about God, definitely about this church that I go to. No, none of you guys, right? You're all very healthy. None of you feel that way, right? You don't know anybody like that? Not at The Rock because we've sent them off to other churches? That's great. It happens, doesn't it? It happens to all of us. Come on. I've got the t-shirt. I have to fight against this. An award-winning novelist by the name of David Foster Wallace, he gave a commencement speech a number of years ago. It was breathtaking in its uh, sincerity to this young group of grads. I don't think too many of them, when they heard his words, uh, walked away going, yeah, that's wise. I'm going to listen to that because it was highly cynical, I would think. He, he wrote a very popular novel. It was actually rated by Time Magazine, one of the top 100 novels since 1923 to the present, which in that day was 2005. His name is David Foster Wallace. The book is Infinite Jest. I have a few quotes from his commencement speech that'll lead us into our text for today. He said this, 
everybody worships. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million, I would like to say, paper cut deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need even more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is this. They're unconscious. They are our default settings. (laughs) Go go change the world, kids. (laughs) But good words, no? To 20-somethings? 30-somethings? 40, 50, 60, anybody? Yeah, good words, wise words. Kind of sounds like if you read Ecclesiastes, our author. He says, everybody worships. He's saying, if you worship, idolize, make anything, any finite material thing, the ultimate thing, it will let you down. You will never be satisfied. This is exactly, exactly what Solomon is getting at in Ecclesiastes. Uh, I I was struck by a, a, a particular quote about this man, David Wallace, That was recorded, and I read it, and it was really struck by it, and it was in his biography that was written a few years after his death. It said, though he made little mention of it in his writings, Wallace belonged to a church wherever he lived. Three years after this commencement speech, he took his own life. He had made millions of dollars from his writings and his books. But as we learned last week in the case of a few other suicides in our world recently, great success, great fame, and all of what comes with it is never enough under the sun. One of my uh, favorite, this is on a positive note for you before we dig in, uh, all-time favorite motivational speakers, probably the only motivational speaker that I can, with a good conscience, recommend to anyone. His name is Zig Ziglar. Um, he, he had often used the wisdom of Solomon to speak about motivation and the proper way to, to have goals and set goals and to seek, quote, success in this life. He said this one time, and, and I, I remember hearing it when I was in my late 20s, and, and I kind of made it a, a, a kind of a quote that I would hold on to for my life as I was growing up so that I wouldn't become that grumpy old man that I'd seen some other family members become. Because I'd already seen myself becoming a bit cynical. And his saying that I love, he said this, is, avoid stinking thinking. It always leads to hardening of the attitudes. Right? It starts really young, It starts really long. Sometimes you pick it up from a parent or from someone you respect because they're that way. Be careful. Remember this. Avoid stinking thinking. It'll just lead to hardening of the attitudes. So, how do you and I avoid stinking thinking? How do we avoid cynicism? How, How do we avoid making the mistakes that Solomon, that God wants us to avoid in this life? Well, I think we need to just look at some of the words that he's given to us here. It, it, it's interesting. Solomon launches into this, some very difficult things, and I'm going to reread them and put them on, on, on the screen for you. Um, but let's remember, these are observations. He's, he's not only written this about his own mishaps and his own 40 years of a wasted life, but during those 40 years, he's also been observing everyone else around him and how they're living their lives and how futile their lives are too, whether they're poor, whether they're rich whether they're a king, whether they're a servant. So it's observations of life. And so again, let me read these words for you. He says this, there's a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time <clears throat> to refrain from embracing. 
a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Now, um, for the sake of time, see what I did there? Um, for the sake of time, let me, let me just summarize this, really, because there's really a big idea here, one point. We could, and we did when we went through the series, go through each one of those, expound on each one of those, and see some amazing things that go on and, and, and learn a great deal from it. But the point that Solomon is driving at is what he said earlier. For everything, there is a time and a season. Essentially, his big point is, guys, Everything here, all of these times, all of these circumstances, this is real life. <laughs> if you're starting out and you're, and you're going out to change the world or, or to do good and, and have a good life, this is the reality. You know, we look at something like to kill and a time to heal, and some people go, to kill? Like, is, is, is there a time for us to go around killing people? Well, people could say that there, there's an appropriate time for, you know, a defensive you know, wars and things like that and whatever. I mean, you could, you could justify that. But you've got to remember also, this is poetry. It's also metaphor. And, and so, you know, oftentimes uh, I've heard preachers and pastors, it's a good way to look at it, is, is in your life, despite the fact that you may not wish for this, you will have broken relationships. We will have broken relationships, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in just personal friend relationships, I've told some of you this before. I had a friend I grew up with in Toronto. I had my very first business with, Aladdin Sound Company. We were DJs in Toronto. We rocked it. It was awesome. I became a Christian. I said something. He didn't talk to me for 15 years. That relationship was killed. There was a time for that. It was hard. For me, it was really hard. I found out later it was hard for him too. And today we're fast friends again. Because why? There was a time to heal that relationship. So we can go through every one of these bit by bit, and we can, we can learn some wonderful, great things from it. You will experience and see times in your life of killing, of healing, of weeping and laughing, of mourning and dancing, and so on. And so, so what did Solomon learn from all of that? Well, what he, what he learned was, most importantly, attempting to live a life like that, with, with even with all the money, all the women, all the possessions, all the, the parties, all the gardens, all the vineyards, all of that for 40 years that he had under the sun apart from the God was not only meaningless and chasing after the wind, it was madness, he said. He got to the point where he thought he was going to go mad, to go crazy, because he had lost so much hope and direction in his life. And it's not a matter of when, kids, or, or it, but it's a matter of if, but when. Some of us will become cynical, and why some people not only become cynical, but become suicidal. Life is hard. It's especially hard if we, as Solomon found out, are trying to do all of this, live this life, achieve this life apart from God. It can't be done. It can't be done. That's his conclusion. That's what he got at. So as you read the rest of Ecclesiastes, and, and to Solomon's conclusion at the very end, which is wonderful, you're going to discover um, details of what it looks like through your life. It's amazing. He actually goes through some of these seasons of your life, and especially he talks about like the end, right? When it gets near the end of his life, because he's a very old man when he's writing this now, like it's 40 years later, uh, at least, he, probably he's in his 80s, 90s, P people figure when he's writing this, that he's writing this book. And, and at the end, it's both, it's kind of funny and sad, really, because he starts talking about, he speaks of, you know, the loss of eyesight, right? And then he talks about the grinders, which is our teeth. Like, you lose, they didn't have good dentistry in that, those days, right? So you lose your teeth and you're kind of gumming your food, right? Like, it's sad but funny, right, the way he puts it. And, and then he also talks about, you know, even a loss of sexual appetite. Hmm. Actually, maybe not a loss of sexual appetite. How about a loss of the function, right? It's coming. It, it's coming, George. Sorry. <laughs> well, he just asked, is it? if we live that long. He's just brutally honest. It's a fantastic book. 
It's just wonderful and truthful. So listen, I, I, I want to really uh, try to apply this to our lives today and look at what he has to say and apply it, and especially related to our message last week about summer and it being a growth period, and what he's sharing with us about the time between when we are born and when we die. And so again, last week, we found that summer was between planting and harvest season, and that summer was for growth of your veggie garden, yes, but also of you spiritually, but also of the seeds that you have planted. Hopefully, disciple makers here at the Rock Church, you've been planting seeds, right? And through the summer, you need to nurture and water and help grow those seeds. Why? Because you hope there will be a harvest in the fall of many men and women who you've been sharing Jesus with and walking with who will come here and gather with us and worship Him with us this fall. And so today, let's see what it is. Obviously, it's life that lies between birth and death. But the question then becomes, what kind of life? What kind of life is it going to be? And what, what, what happens in those seasons? What is that all about? So I'm not sure if you've noticed already, but there are a few standard seasons in everyone's lives, right? Um, most of you know my background, and, and again, I'll state it, but I spent 30 years in the marketplace and in the field of marketing. One of the things that marketers have done is, I mean, they're just, a, they're just good observing people, right? They observe culture. Why? Because they want to manipulate you <laughs> and, and get you to buy stuff that you don't necessarily need but want. And so they've created something called segmentation. And so they, they're, it's nothing new under the sun. They know the seasons of our lives. And so what they do is they go, okay, there's childhood years. Okay, so we're going to put all the really sugary stuff at the grocery store on the lowest shelves, right? So that when you go there, you know, the kids. So we have our childhood years, and that's a particular season that we go through. And we've got mom and dad who are looking after us in those childhood years, and we need them to guide us and teach us and instruct us, right? And then after the childhood years, there, there's the teen years, right? And it's in, it's in the teenage years that most of our parents are yelling at us constantly, make your bed, right? right? Anybody? Have you got that t-shirt? Clean up your room, okay? <laughs> like, please, you're 28. <laughs> you know? right. But we have these seasons, right? And, and so th there's these segments. There's teenage years, and then there's the real big one in the life of the, the culture, but it is for us too. This is the 18 to 34 demographic, right? That's a big age because you go from 18 to 34, you, you got a few seasons going on there, right? You've got the season of education and learning and knowledge, high school, university, you're getting prepared for the big change the world career, right? Where you're going to go on and do things. And then there's, of course, most of us hope that there's a season called marriage. You know, you fall in love with someone and, and you have a season of marriage, or at least the beginning of a season of marriage, because that season is supposed to go on for a long time, right? That's a long season. And then there's another season that many of you are giving yourself to right now. It's called children, right? Babies. There's a, there's a season when you're a parent, and you're raising those infants and toddlers and young people again who turn into teenagers and you teach them all to make beds. It just, it just keeps going around, right? Over and over again. But then there's a period between 35 and 55 where it's interesting how we settle into this next season. I mean, we've got, we got the kids. We got, we now, we've gone from the condo to the townhome, hopefully to the single family dwelling, right? And now it's the years of acquisition, right? We've, we're acquiring property, assets, you know, cars, boats, Trains, planes, automobiles, whatever, toys, material things, right? Mostly things that we don't need, but we've seen an ad, <laughs> and we get attracted to it, and we just feel like we have to do them. And then finally, we work through that season, and we arrive at my favorite, Freedom 55, right? That's a marketing line, guys, from London Life, way back in the 80s. And you all know it, we all know it. Unfortunately, for most of us, that Freedom 55 has been backed up a little bit, right? Because we need to make more to get to the next phase, which is hopefully 65 to 75 or longer, which is the point in our lives where we wear the T-shirt and we go, we go we're, we're, living, we're, we're living the dream now. Yeah, we're living the dream and we're doing something else. Desperately trying to avoid death. The end of the book. The book end. But those are the seasons, right? Those are the seasons that we are given. And in our North American culture, one, one can actually live a pretty good life for the most part, apart from God even, and, and even avoid the curse of cynicism. One can do that. It's possible. But it's rare, isn't it? Isn't it rare, honestly? Because again, let's remember, seasons are hard. Most of us don't deal with those seasons well. And therefore, the cynicism starts to creep in. 
And there's an area of our lives where all of us become really bitter and, and, and really cynical. And I've seen that happen in my own family, and, I, and I'm trying to crush it daily in my own life. Trust me. Pray for me, please. But I've seen it happen, and it's sad, isn't it? It's so sad to see people become so bitter and, and critical of young people, those millennials. You know? Make your beds. I always come back to that. So you want to avoid that, of course, if you can. But then there are the very few who are happy, who are content, who are satisfied. I think of my wife's mother and father. It's just such an example to us in our faith, in our walk, in our lives. They have great difficulty physically in their lives today. Dad has Parkinson's and a back where he can barely walk, and, and mom's got issues, and uh, they are joyful in the Lord every day. The seasons of their lives, the way that they have grown into that is such a blessing. Such a blessing. And those of you who have met them and know them, you know what I say is absolutely true. So now what is it that God would have us do since, since, listen, he is the one who appoints these times. That's hard, but he is the one who appoints these times and these seasons in our lives. Well, to start, we learned this from Solomon last week, and this will take us to our conclusion today, and I think it applies today. Solomon, again, through his observations, he said this, I perceived that there is nothing better for them. All of those people in his community and, and his country and, and his people of Israel, but also everyone that was his servants, everyone that was in his courts, for them then to be joyful <laughs> despite the circumstances, to do good for others, which takes you out of the cynicism of your own life because you're, you're helping others become less cynical and, and be joyful. Do good as long as they live. Also that and everyone should look, eat and drink and take pleasure in all his or her work, in our toil. This is God's gift to man. <laughs> That's a bold statement. I love it. It's so true and so encouraging. So Solomon not only shares, as I've said, his, his personal life experiment with us, but he's also observing everyone else's life. His conclusion his conclusion is, essentially, through this whole book, but also in our passages today, that no matter what season of life you are in, being joyful and doing good should be your focus. This summer, this fall, this winter, in the season of rain that some of us don't like, be joyful, do good. Imagine how helpful, honestly, think about that. That might be in the life of those who are in the same season of you, but not deal with, dealing with it very well. Christian, let me challenge you on this. You being grumpy and cynical, and I could use a few other adjectives, in a season that God has appointed for you is not a good testimony to this world. Amen? Let's all repent and confess. We're in this together, right? Okay? Okay? but we need, to, we need to trust that and believe that. He also perceived this, he says, I perceive that whatever God does, oh boy, endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. There's nothing new under the sun. I added that, but that's from verse, chapter 1, verse 14. And God seeks what he has driven away. Remember he asked in verse 9 these words, what gain has the worker from his toil? Well, the sad news is Solomon declares, and it's the truth, at the end of the day, no matter what you and I do, we're just a blip in history. We're, we're an infant, like, really, we're a blip in history. So the, the, the truth of it is, it sounds, go change the world, great, but nothing is your gain. The times, they cancel each other out, right? They cancel each other out. The, the truth is, the only gain, the only thing that endures is God and what He has done. I'm good with that. I hope you're good with that. that that's a blessing in our lives. It's, it's what God does. And so Solomon encourages us in verse 11 with these words. And then they're, they're the words I want to send you with today with also a couple of suggestions. And it is this. He says, He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Now listen, 
Christian, you, you don't, maybe you should raise your hand. Do you believe the Word of God? <laughs> yeah, okay, some of, some of, very hesitant here. I, okay, right, because you know what's coming, right? Everything is beautiful in its time. If you and I were able to live through all of these things, through all of the circumstances of our lives, from the beginning to the end of God's creation, of what God can see from a million miles up, you would see, I would see, that He has made everything good in its time. Everything is made good in its time. And lastly, He says that He has put eternity into our hearts. He has put this into our very hearts, this idea that the perfect season that you and I all want, (laughs) the perfect summer, the perfect winter, whatever is your favorite season, is to come. It's not in this life. This life can be joyful. It can be good, especially with God in our lives, only with God in our lives. But it is to come. And so let me, let me leave you with a few things, a few suggestions for you this summer. Last week, the idea was, hey, um, grow. Read some books, right? Get some really good books and grow in your spiritual understanding uh, of the Scripture, of God, of who He is, of the church, of who you are as a disciple in the church, Get some books about your work, your career, what you're doing. Like, improve yourself, right? Grow. It's a time for growing in all those areas. Well, let me suggest to you from this passage today and what we talked about today is know what season you're in. Take some time this summer and and do some evaluation. I, I actually do it every summer when we go away. I read. I've got like five books to take with me this summer that I'm reading. I'm always reading, but I'm taking five in particular I want to get through. And, and, uh, but I was also... Do an assessment. Okay, how have how, how I been, do- been doing? Often I ask my wife, and that's a scary thing, how have I been doing? Well, she goes, I got a list. <laughs> she, she helps me with my assessment. But, but, but also about the season of life you're in. And, and ask yourself the honest question, how am I doing? Am I enjoying this season? We're, we're going through a rather odd season right now, right? Well, you know, our church ministry, it, we feel is good, and the church is growing, and we're blessed by all you guys, and, and we love Squamish and all the rest of it, but we're, we have an empty house. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Like, like, they're all out right now, right? But by the same token, we're like, and your name is again? Right? <laughs> like, there's just the, it's a whole new season, and we are beginning, we're having conversations, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. what are we going to do tonight, Right? There's not that to do. That's a different season. And, and uh, you know, we miss Jonathan a little, right? But it's a new season. And am I, am I ready to embrace it? I, I don't know, but I need to. So what season are you in? Ask yourself that question. And, and be careful about things like, well, I didn't choose this season. You know, like, <laughs> God, I didn't choose this season. You know, I want that season. Be very careful about that as well. Don't be looking back and going, yeah, you know, when I was single, that was way better. (laughs) This guy, you know, like this woman. Like, don't do that. It's funny, but it's not funny, is it? We do that. We're always like we're in a season that God has put us in, and then we're looking back going, oh, oh, man, I was so much happier then. Or we're in a season, and I'm really bad at this, I have to confess. I'm really bad being a visionary, you know, like, okay, that sounds like a good word. But, you know, I'm always looking ahead to the next great thing, you know right? And, and I, I get dissatisfied with the season that I'm in very easily. It's not good. That's what I have to work on. I don't know about you. Lastly, do you notice in, in relation to that, do you notice in these passages, there's a lot of this eating and drinking, right? L- let me encourage you that p- part of the, this metaphor that's in there is this. Every season you're in, eat it. Eat it up. Drink it up. Share it. But also there's another aspect to that, isn't there? Missional community group members. Eating and drinking is to be done in family, in community. So that's a really important uh, assessment for this summer. So I just leave you with those two things that, number one, this summer, grow. Spend some time on your personal growth. Read Ecclesiastes, maybe. There's a good book, right, to take with you this summer and to digest and allow the Holy Spirit you know, to teach you, just you, through the Holy Spirit, what this has to say and personally grow. And secondly, take time to assess what season am I in? And you know what? Eat it up. Drink it up. Thank God for the season that you're in. Finish it well before the next season comes along. Pray with me, would you? Gracious Heavenly